um, <clears throat> the creed of the Creole, in his very first editorial, G.W. Brathwaite hit its editor said that there are, few, there are few people in this community so blind as not to have discovered the main characteristics of the administration under which we live. It holds out to the colony no reasonable promise of an advance in property and contentment. He says, he goes on to say that there is one issue of which in particular we would speak in this our opening article. The spirit of dislike or contemptuous aversion to a large class of Her Majesty's subjects living under his rule and dependent upon the character of his administration. Governor Woodhouse displays a denunciation towards this despised and hated race. But then he goes on to say, now we wish to make it understood once and for all. The man who assumes superiority over others on account of his color and the man who acknowledges inferiority to others on account of his color are both fools and like and that this simple exposition of her creed and this is our simple exposition of our creed on the subject so they're dealing with issues of race they're just dealing with labor issues they're dealing with issues of unfair taxation they're dealing in a huge huge sense with immigration and I found that looking at the way in which immigration was dealt with in the Creole because remember they are now they are covering a long period of, of, of time just before Indian immigration ends, um, that begins, right? So there are, people are looking, we, we see an African side of the immigration question, how they felt about immigration, about people coming and what some of the real issues were. And one of the things that has really touched me is the fact that they made a very early, early distinction in their article saying, we are not against these people who are coming. We are not against these people who are coming. We understand that this is a colonial strategy that will work against both sides in the end. And I find that, 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 that looking back at what developed later on, um, this was a very insightful kind of um, of, of analysis for them to make that early. I am not dwelling on that. One of the reasons why I believe that the, the Creole was able to survive this long was because of a number of people who were very influential in its, its, um, in its survival, not survival, but in creating it in the first instance. And this is one of the way the, the place plays places where I would really like help from historians. I know I've written to people saying, could you tell me who these people are? Because um, I've, I've been looking. You've seen their names popping up over and over in the manuscripts, and some of them I've been able to find, find out who they are, and others I haven't. But for instance, this is a meeting of, this is an actual note that was in, in the Creole of 1857, advertising a meeting of the contributors to the fund of the Creole. So clearly, people were actually funding this. And they were not only, it not only survived from subscriptions. People were giving money to the Creole and then they had advertisers. What I found that was very, very interesting about the advertising in the Creole, and I only discovered this very recently, was the fact that the Creole had a, seemed to have a stock set of advertisers. There were five particular people who advertised in the Creole continuously and then you had one or two others. You had um, adver advertisements in the Creole that were also different in their content and nature from other papers like the, the Argosy or the Colonist. For instance, you would never see in the Creole an advertisement for dog races or horse races or fine hats, never, right? But what you'll find in the Creole is an advertisement for when the steamer is coming and going where for pork barrels coming in with food for um, later on you would even find a list because a friend of mine asked me the other day what were Indians eating back then and I found an ad in the Creole later on that advertised peas coming in this time flour coming in this time dal coming in um, ghee coming in this time and so on so they, they were clearly catering to a particular uh, set of people while the other pap papers were catering to others, it's very interesting. But some of these people who were actually involved in 
the, the newspapers, both as writers, but as distributors of the paper and as backers of the paper, also had very, very important roles to pay, play in the colonial, um, the, the colored colonial political scene. For instance, this man, W.M. Jansen, had been in the forefront of the fight to have colored pastors included in churches. And he was one of the, the distributors of the paper and also wrote for the paper every now and then. James Curry, founder of the, the local Young Men's Christian Association and was also very involved in the revival of the village movement. D.S. Ross, this is a very interesting man, a, a foulest plantation owner who actually took over a plantation and ran it successfully for 20 years. And this is after the British basically said, well, we can't, sugar is no longer um, you know, viable as, as, a, as an ec economic endeavors. But he's, there he is doing this after slavery as a black man. A number of these were school teachers who became lawyers, churchmen, and so on. And they basically carried on the business of the newspaper, funding it, distributing it, and collecting advertisements for it, collecting advertisements for it uh, around the country. They also raised funds by, and this was funny, by printing um, stationery. So you saw that if you did 13 words, it was two pence. And then later on, they went up to 17 pence. And if you had an, a design on it, it was so much. So they also did this to help them to, to create. So Rodney is now in his book, History of the Working People of Guyana, really pays some attention to the role of the press in his writing. It's not foregrounded, but if you are looking, as I was, for this, these kinds of uh, perspectives, you find it. And he says here that the Creole, the working and the working man, this is another paper that did not really uh, survive that long, assumed the mantle of spokesperson of the middle and lower classes in the 1870s. And the same role was later played in the 1880s by the villager, the echo, the reflector, and the liberal. These, are all, these didn't last for more than five years each. So Creole is really spanning and out surviving all of them. But there's an interesting, another interesting reason why this would happen. The latter, these latter were small newspapers run by practicing journalists who also doubled as, as job printers and producers of stationery. In touch with the grievances of wage earners and small farmers, these sections of the press carried out on profuse and abrasive criticism of the governor, senior civil servants, and the judiciary. So they would sit there and basically snipe away as far as, as, far, as far as they could on the problems and the, and, the, and the administrators who were there of the day. Now, one of the things that was interesting about the Creole, which is also why I thought that it would have survived, was that when the Portuguese started to come into the country, the Creole, they started to advertise in Portuguese in their paper. And remember, the Portuguese are interested now in selling, reta they're retailers, they're selling goods to people. So clearly what they want people to buy and what they're selling is of importance to the African mass, which was the captive audience for, this, for the Creole. So they started to actually advertise very heavily in the Creole and that helped them. There was also a period in which the British government which was supposed to, and this might sound familiar, they were supposed to give all the, the gazetted um, uh, the notices to all the papers, and they would pay. And at one point, they got vexed with the Creole and stopped giving them um, ads. But the Creole in, 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 in serious um, you know, kind of reactants, to that basically said whether or not you pay us we are going to publish this stuff because people need to know this stuff and in fact people buy the paper in order to know read these notices you know land notices and all these kinds of things so after a while they basically gave them back the money like after a year 
and they wrote a very vitriolic editorial, very, very um, reminiscent of David Kears, it's interesting that I should be in this house, which basically said, you know, that you can't muzzle me by taking away, muzzle us by taking away the, the advertising. Our, the people who buy our papers and our backers, and God, they said God, they put a very, very heavy, heavy um, emphasis on God, and God will see that we will survive. Um, so, and they did. So, um, one of the, hmm. pretty sure I had another slide here with, wrong place, anyway. <laughs> um, one of the very interesting things that the Creole ended in, stopped publishing in 1907, very strange, because it appeared twice a week. And it consistently did this for a while. And all of a sudden, in 1907, in the middle of the week, which is a Thursday, this paper just stops publishing. And this is, a, this is something that I have not been able to uh, figure out why, because this is very preliminary work. I'm still working on it among the other things that I have to do. Uh, I don't know if it is because Patrick Dargan, who was then its editor, and you know, those who are historians know the name Patrick Dargan from QC, from, you know, you know, it's a big name. He was editing the paper, and one of the very interesting things I found in here was one of his ads that for when he was running for office in Georgetown. And this is his ad. It says, men are, are measure. The great struggle in the history of the country has commenced. This is the first election that is going to happen now. That, and, I, and looking at that, that ad in the Creole was, it was, it, it, I can't describe the feeling of actually seeing this first moment in the history of the country, you know, recorded like that. Um, but you can't read the ad, so I am writing it out here. The great struggle in the history of the country has commenced, and there are thousands watching and waiting anxiously for the parting of the ways. The issue involved may be linked to capital versus labor, and a short while will suffice to decide the supremacy of one or the other. Which shall it be? Electors of Georgetown, be watchful. The destiny of this country is in your hands, and we would advise you to use that power for your country's good by selecting from the candidates before you, one whose sympathies are with you. It is a momentous question, but if you judge not men, but measure, you will not. We are confident, hesitate to plump for one who has served. Clearly this plump is somebody who was, because um, that's exactly how it appears, who was running as well. We are confident, hesitate to plump for one who has served you faithful, faithfully and well. Need we say who he is? Vote for the right man. Vote for Patrick Dargan. Also vote for Starbrook store. The right store for you at the right prices. <laughs> that I thought was funny. <laughs> so he is on the front page of this paper for many, many, many months. Every single ed edition you would see this ad coming out. But also they would have these ads, you know, of why really edu the first voter education really, um, why you should be a voter. First notice, up to five notices they had for unregistered voters to come and vote and things like that. So really and truly, I think that this paper, given that, given that it was existing for so long, covered so many diverse issues, was so widely distributed. The no details that I've seen from scholars who study papers, people like Lewis and so on, indicate that in colony countries such as Jamaica and Trinidad and so on, you may have one paper being distributed, distributed maybe about a thousand copies, which was really great in those days. But we have been able to kind of extrapolate from notes and other things that this paper may have actually surpassed some of those and distributed up to 1,400 copies, which is really, really, really interesting. And that's another reason why I think we could have seen them survive because they were actually, they were subscriptions you would pay.